thank you for coming. This is Man Church. We just gather. Really, it's our men's ministry. We call it Man Church, and we gather to talk about men's stuff and to kind of allow the Word of God to kind of transform us. We kind of look at the Word from a man's perspective. So anybody new? Anybody new in here? Just raise your hand if you're new to Man Church. Good. We're glad you're here. We're glad, you want, we, we're glad you're here. So just relax, and I know it's going to come off a little bit different tonight because it, it, then on a Sunday morning, on a Sunday morning, we have ladies here. We have, you know, we have families here. So tonight we get together so that we can talk a little straighter. Is that all right? So that we can just call it like it is. And, and, and the, you know, we believe that the strength of the church is going to come from the strength of the men in the church. That's one thing I, I, that we believe. We believe that there's a role. How many of you know that you're different than a woman? Does any, everybody know that? Yes? Okay. Because we can do an anatomy lesson really quick and to show everybody you're different than a woman. Physically, you're different than a woman. You think differently than a woman. There's actually scientific things that happen when a girl is born. The, the, the frontal lobe of their brain is actually connected and yours is not. The men undergo something called an androgen wash when they're in the womb. And when an androgen wash happens, it separates the left and the right in the brain. Did you know that? Yes. It does. It does, Timothy. Don't shake your head no. And so what happens is, have you ever been with a lady and they, they start talking? I, I was with my wife and she'll be talking to me. And she'll start talking about, yeah, and, uh, you know, Sister So-and-So called me today, and, you know, and uh, she was telling me about something that was going on in, in her house. By the way, at our house, we need to change this thing over here because uh, the, the, the toilet's not working right at our house. And, and then she goes from Sister So-and-So's house to my house, and then we go into my house, and then she's off on, I saw a house over in Katy that I really liked, that I really want to move into, and then all of a sudden we're back. Well, anyway, Sister So-and-So was telling me. Does that ring with anybody in here? Does it, are you married? You know what I'm talking about. They can, they, they call, we call it noodling because a woman's brain is like spaghetti. Not, 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 not bad. It, it, it's, it's all intertwined, and they'll go from one thought to another thought to another thought, and you'll get this, this, you'll get like eight conversations in 15 minutes, and you're like, man, what, 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 what did we start on? You know what I mean? And they noodle, and they noodle four or five noodles, and then they end up back on the original noodle, and then they get mad because you lost it on the third noodle. You were like, I'm still thinking about fixing the toilet at the house, you know? Men are like waffle. Yeah, we have waffle brains. That androgen wash, we have waffle brains. You ever seen like a waffle that has like the squares, right, compartments? We can compart Men can compartmentalize. Women can't compartmentalize as good as men in general. You'll find an anomaly every once in a while. You'll find a guy that noodles every once in a while. You know, they didn't quite get the full androgen wash. You know, I don't know how that works, but you, you do have, I'm, I'm talking in general terms. So men, men can compartmentalize. That makes you a great problem solver. It makes you, like, be able to, to go to work and deal with a bunch of nonsense and then come put it in the box, and then I leave my work box at work, and then I come over here, and I can do something else. And you can function. Ladies, can't, they, they can't let that go. They, they go home with it. They think about it. You know you're asleep. In 15 minutes, you lay your head back, you're snoring. And mama's sitting there thinking about everything she's got to do, everything that happened that day. Because women are like spaghetti and men are like waffles, so we compartmentalize. So because of that, we, we deal with things differently. And even in the Word, we've got to, we, we, we believe that we're different, but we fill specific roles in the church and in society and in our families. So we still believe that the men, the, if you're married and you're a man, you're the pastor of your house. And you're supposed to be the leader, the spiritual leader of your home. And God made you to be able to compartmentalize, to handle things a certain way. And he made her to noodle because that's just the way he made her. And so it's not, it's not, it's not that one's bad and one's, wrong, one's right or one's wrong. It's that they're different. 
You, anybody understand? Anybody ever, you, did you know that as a man you have a nothing box? You have a box that's nothing. When your wife looks at you and she says, What's, what are you thinking about? Nothing. <laughs> you have a box and, and it's true. And it's true. You can be sitting there and you got nothing. And you're enjoying having nothing. You know what I'm saying? You're enjoying that you don't have anything to think about. You, don't, you, you needed that break. So man church, we try to grab us together. We try to say we're different. We're not better. We're different. So, so a lot of times the attack, on, I don't know if you are aware, but our culture is, uh, is attacking the patriarchal mindset, right? They don't like the patriarchal idea. In fact, they think because in, in some cases, in a lot of cases, the way we've been going in our culture, we've abused it. You, you know, there, there has been abuse by, by guys being dictators in their homes and, and guys mistreating ladies. And I mean, you see it on the news. You can see it on the news, right? There, there's abuse. But the thing about it is the minute that there's abuse, we want to throw it away and we want to get rid of it. But God designed it a certain way. So it's not about getting rid of it. It's about sanctifying it and changing it and making it right. And so who's going to do that except for the men in the church? Because I hope you're not waiting on anybody in Washington, D.C. to come up with a solution. Because they're not. They're not going to come up with a solution. God picked you, picked you to be here tonight, picked you to be in this church, picked you to be here to hear something, that maybe he could start something in you, and maybe something needs to start by you changing because really that's how things change. Things don't, anybody have kids? You, you know, you, when, when you go to your kid and, and you tell them what you want them to, like, like if you told them, listen, you need to be honest and quit lying. Do any of your kids lie? Don't, don't, don't lie in here. I know they do, they all do. You know, I read a statistic the other day that said, check this out, the University of Massachusetts did a study and they said every, of a of, uh, hundred adults, sixty percent of the adults within ten minutes lied at least once in the conversation. Do you hear me? Sixty percent of adults embellished or lied some lied within the first ten minutes of the conversation. For no reason. They weren't trying to get away with anything. It's just in the course of conversation. It, I think we've. We've developed a habit of lying, of making things out to be the way they, they really aren't out to be and kind of leaning things my way a little bit, right, you know? So, so I, guess, I guess it depends on what you consider to be a lie, right? What I'm saying is you're never going to change somebody by reasoning and explaining the, pro the problem to somebody. Somebody always got to, they got to get a revelation inside them that changes them. Because if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. You're telling them, and you're telling them, and you're telling them. And the more you tell them, the, the more they don't listen. They, they, they don't get it. But, but, but until they move out of the house and they got their own rent to pay and you're not paying it, they get this revelation like, oh, man, I got to go to work. <laughs> or, or, or they come and they say, you, can I borrow 20 bucks for gas? No, I ain't got no gas money for you. You moved out. I'm, I'm telling. I'm talking about me and how I did it. But when they, when I, I told them the minute when you move out of my, I have all girls, and even with my girl, I have all girls. I said, when you move out, you're on your own. Because you're moving out because you don't want to listen to the rules. So if you want to be grown, then be grown. And when grown people don't got gas money, they just don't got gas money. Am I right? We, we got to have that back into our families, you know, and I'm not mean about it. I'm just saying, hey, you can live at my house, obey my rules. I'll pay all your bills for as long as you want, but you move out, you're on your own because you want to be grown. You want to do, you want to do what grown people do. Well, you should have not bought that, that 12 pack with that $20 <laughs> and you should have put gas in your car instead of now you're coming to me with beer on your breath Then you need gas. Can I get an amen from any... Yeah. Is this real church or not? Or do you, want me to, do you want me to just make it religious and just leave here religious? 
but we all got these problems, we all got these situations going on in our homes, it's a real deal. And the problem with the church is we, don't, we, want to, we want to facade and act like we're something when we're not anything, and we don't know how to deal with, with the real deal. So we enable our kids. We keep enabling them and doing for them and giving to them. And, and you know, I'm not saying to be ugly to your kids, but there's got to be choices and consequences. I don't know if y'all ever, I just learned that growing up as a young man. I, I learned that if I chose to drive drunk and they pulled me over, that I was going to go to jail. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Am I, am I talking to the right play? So, so, you, so we've got to get back to the idea of we begin to teach our children where you say, listen, if you, there's choices to make, and every choice has a consequence, and some consequences are good, and some consequences are bad. So, so make good choices. See, because a lot of times we think that we got to run and, 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 and get them out of the consequence. Right, because when we deal with the schools, we got a lot of a lot of mamas running to the school trying to get their kid off the drug charge over a technicality. When probably the best thing for that kid would be to to face the full brunt of the consequence, so that he can learn a lesson to not do it again. Am I right? Mamas wouldn't. They won't like. They will not like this message if they were in here, because inside they want to nurture that. That's my baby. I birthed that baby. I, when they look at you, even though you got hair all over your face, man, they see a baby. I, I don't see nothing but hair on the face and bad breath. I'm like, brother, you need to face the consequences. They need dads in the house to step up and say, here's what we're going to do. This is how we're going to run this house. Amen? Amen. You, you understand what I mean? So, so we gather on Wednesday nights to, to, to figure out how do we change you might be sitting in here and you're thinking, man, I, I, I'm doing pretty good or what, whatever, you know, I don't know. I mean, everybody's got a different story. But I, I do know this, that any time that we require change, we always want to look at everybody else that needs to change. And we, we never look at ourselves. And we had a devotional this morning with my staff here, and we were talking about change, and we were talking about uh, uh, all of the things that, 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 you know, you find yourself going through stuff, and it's everybody else's fault. You know what I mean? Don't raise your hand if, you, if that's you. But, but eventually, one day, you've got to wake up and say, maybe things are jacked up because of me. Man, what a revelation when you get to the place where you can honestly look at yourself. I had to honestly look at myself with, with, in, in parenting my oldest, my oldest daughter. And I had to look at her situation and I had to get to the place where I was like, this is my fault. Everybody else came around and told me, Pastor Robert, it's not your fault. You know, when they get old, they got to make their own decisions. They got to, they got to, you know, and some of the, and that's true. You know, people grow up and they make their own decisions and you could have raised them a certain way, but they went a different way. But the truth, if we're really, 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 really honest, if we're really just dead, dead honest, just looking at yourself, I can't tell you that I did the best job I could have done. Can I? You know what I mean? And so my, my thing is, I, I'm walking through this with you, and I'm wondering, can you get to the place where you can be honest with yourself? To look at yourself and see the gaps in you. Don't see the gaps in everybody else. I mean, you're going to see the gaps in everybody else. What I'm saying is, can you look at yourself and can you just take responsibility for it being jacked up? For your marriage being bad. For your kids going crazy. For whatever. And it, it, it occurred to me that that's the biggest and hardest part for a man to do, is to get to a place where he just is brutally honest with himself, looking at himself going, man, I, I, I made some mistakes. And then, having the intestinal fortitude or the, the intestinal fortitude to go and to say to somebody, man, I'm really sorry for what I did. It's my fault that you're in the position you're in. It's partly my fault. 
I know you're making bad decisions, but it's partly my fault, and I want you to forgive me. Man, we don't do that. I'm just going to tell you right now. Nobody ever wants to do that. But what I found, and I'm talking about me, so these are things that I've had to do in my life. As I've learned to become a better husband, to become a better parent, is to own up to things. If it ain't that good, maybe it's my fault because that's what the leader does. The leader looks at the whole, anybody ever have a boss that's always blaming everybody else? You know? I mean, after a while, if you're the boss and everybody's leaving, you got to say, what am I doing? Right? Or no. <laughs> maybe there's some bosses in here that needed to hear that. After a while, if you've gone through five accountants, Man, did you, I mean, you got you to gotta hone your hiring skills. Or you got to ask yourself, man, is, my, is this culture that I've created here? So I, I'm talking about work because you can identify with work, right? If you get helpers, so you're a plumber, right, Alan? So if you get helper after helper after helper, what are the odds that you get 10 helpers and you fire them the second day every time? After a while, you got to be like, have I created something that they can't be in, Right? So I'm talking about work because y'all can all identify with work. Now, how about your family? Have you created something in your family that's impossible? You know, I'll, I'll tell on me. I created, I created an expectancy towards some of, so towards my children that I couldn't even meet. Do you know what I'm saying? I created a, a, a thing, and it sounded great. I looked, it looked great from the outside, but when I really stopped and looked at it, I was like, man, I'm not even doing that. Read your Bible every night. Do you read your Bible every night? You need to pray every night. Do you pray every night? I don't want you drinking and driving. Do you drink and drive? Because it's easy to demand something from someone. It's a whole other thing to model it and be an example of what it is. Some people say, because I don't, you know, I personally don't drink. I came out of a lifestyle of addiction and alcohol. When I, when I get around alcohol, it's not good. Some people will be like, come on, man, just have one. I was like, oh, you don't want me to have one, brother. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You don't even want me, No. You don't even know what you're talking about. I know me. So I made a decision, you know, because I came out of that lifestyle, and I said, you know, I'm, I, I don't want my children to, to be in it, right? And so at the end of the day, if, if my children drink, it's not because I modeled it for them. It's because they're choosing to do it. They're always going to have a choice to do it, but they didn't learn it at my house. You understand what I'm saying? They did not learn it at my house. And as long as I could be in charge and in control, and you know as the older they get, you lose more and more control. <laughs> but as long as I was in control, there was none of that going on, at the, right? So because I chose, I said, you know, if I'm going to ask somebody to do something, then I, I, I've got to be willing to do it myself. Though these are key little principles, guys, that a lot of times it, it, it actually it makes people leave the church because you come to church and you see the hypocrisy in the church. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You know you do, because some people will tell you, I don't want to go to church because those guys, they're all one way on Sunday, and then they're a different way on Monday, and they're a different way on Tuesday. They don't live it out. And so part of man church is to say, you need to start living it out. And you know what? Sometimes you're the lone ranger living it out in your own home. But sometimes we can get enough guys like this and we all start living it out, right? But we all got to live it out. My dream is to be able to gather men here today that are all living it out, but they're really living it out. They're not just saying they're living it out. So my challenge to you is, what can you do in your lifestyle to live it out to be able to become the pastor of your house? So just like I'm the pastor of this house, there's an expectation. If you go to this church, there's an expectation of me and my lifestyle. Right? Am I right? I mean, I don't think any of y'all would be cool 
if you went down to the local nightclub, which you shouldn't be there, and you walked in, and I'm bellied up at the bar drinking, would you be cool with that? You'd be, be coming to my church? Right? Is it right? You, you wouldn't be cool, right? See, it's easy for you to look at me and say that it wouldn't be cool. But what about you? Why is it cool for you? Because nobody wants to look at inside. Everybody wants to. It's easy for you to tell me that ain't cool, man. I ain't following you, but you want to do it. You, you, you want to. Why is it good for you? Could that be why your kids are going crazy and your wife won't submit to you? Because you're just like the pastor that's living a double life. You're the pastor in your house, but you got a double life thing going. It's, it's, it's the same thing. The model of me standing here preaching to you, you should see yourself right where I'm at and your family sitting on the front row and they're looking to you as a leader. So there's a responsibility that you have to pastor your family. There's no way around that. That's what God called you to do. You can run from it. You can deny it. You can, you know, I told people on Sunday, you can choose Jesus or you cannot, right? You can say yes or you can say no. But some of us will say, well, I'm just not going to make a choice. You've already said no. By not facing that thing, you've already said no. So we're in the book of 1 Samuel 16. And, and so I, I want you to get... This, this front part of what I'm talking about, of what we're about, what we need to do, you've got to be a pastor. So you've got to be able to read your Bible. We were talking about fundamentals. You've got to be able to read your Bible and see out of the characters of the Bible. Right now we're going to be talking about David. But you've got to be able to see through David some of the things that God sees so that you can figure out how do I apply this. So... It's, it's good for you to come and to hear me. You, you hear me? It's good for you to come here and hear me. But it's not enough. You've got to get to the place where you can open this book and you can hear like I hear. You can read and hear and discern what the Spirit of God is telling you on your own. So my, my job is not to draw you unto me in here, but to draw you here to equip you to say, read these stories in a way that you can ask yourself, what is this story saying about God? What is this story saying about me? What do I need to do? What do I not need to do? And how do I apply this in my life? Those, those questions are critical when you're reading the Bible. Or else you're just reading. But if you really want to dissect and divide the word of truth and to be able to see what is it saying, you've got to ask yourself, what does it say? So we're talking, I mean, if you have your Bible, we're in 1 Samuel 16. This is the story of when Samuel anoints David. So I'm going to paraphrase and then I'm going to read, okay? I'm going to tell you the story and then I'm going to read pieces of the story so that you can see this thing. But so, so what, what happened was the God sent Samuel to go see a guy named Jesse in Bethlehem. Is it Bethlehem? Yes? Yes. He said, go find a guy, that his name's Jesse, he lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be the new king. Now Saul had been king, but Saul had messed up, so God is speaking a new king. So he sent Samuel the prophet to go find David, and when he gets down into Jesse's house, you know, they, they throw a big, a big they're, they're doing uh, uh, sacrifices, and they have a little deal at the house, and Samuel walks in, and the first guy he sees is a guy named Eliab, and it was David's oldest brother. So, so Jesse gathered the, the sons, and there was a bunch of them. Right? There's 12 of them or something. Eight of them, sorry. So he, he looked at the first one. He goes, this has got to be the guy. He was tall. He had the stature. He looked like somebody that would be in charge. You know what I'm saying? On the outside, he looked like this guy has got to be the king. When they arrived, the Bible says in verse 6, he took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Verse 7, listen. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't make decisions the way you do. 
I'm in the NLT version in my Bible. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at a person's thoughts and intentions. Another, uh, uh, the, the ESV says he looks at the heart. This is important to understand and to know how the Lord looks. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you could get lost in the story and you think, well, he doesn't look at my arms and if, and if I got a belly and if I work out or if I don't. But you can also look at this and say, he doesn't look at what you do on the outside. He doesn't care how you look. You know, because sometimes we come to church and we want to look a certain way. We have a facade on. You fought all the way here from your house to the parking lot. And then Brother Oscar in the parking lot ministry, you're, you're, like, you're like making that stink face to your wife and you're... And then you see Brother Oscar, and you're like, hey, brother, praise the Lord. We made it. And so we, we, we get in this thing, man, where we, we try to fake it till we make it, and then we, we, we come to church, and on the outside, we look like we got it going on, but, on, but God doesn't look at the outside. The Bible says he does not look at the outside. He does not look at the outside. Tonight, man, you've got to decide and understand and put in your reminder. Put, he never looks at the outside. He doesn't care what you did. He doesn't care what you're doing. He doesn't care how you look on the outside. He cares about your heart. He cares about your motive. Your pure, your, 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 are you have a pure motive or do you have a selfish motive? He cares about whether you're ambitious, whether you're manipul are you manipulative, are you trying to get your way all the time? How do you treat your wife? How do you treat your children? How do you treat your employees? How do you treat your workers? He cares about all of that stuff. All the other stuff doesn't matter to him. Dr. Cole says, you could take a faithful man, and you could make him able. But you can't take an able man and make him faithful. So you can have all the talent in the world and be disloyal, untrustworthy, unfaithful. And that comes from you on the inside of you. The talent can be taught to you. You all ever see people that get pr promoted just to lose it all because they have no character. They get to a place where their, their talent takes them to places where their character cannot sustain them. You get power. They put you in positions of power. How, so, so let me ask you all a question. So how do you determine, like let's say we're here in this church, how do you determine who you promote and who you don't. Anybody? By who you can rely, consistency? By the fruits they bear? Integrity? By faithfulness. You know what faithfulness is? It's being obedient for a time. So, if you're obedient to me today, Austin, you're one day faithful. And that's good. But day two is coming, and day three is coming. When, when Pastor GF handed me this church, it was 18 years of faithfulness. Do you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't come from five years. It doesn't come from 10. And it wouldn't have come if I'd have quit. And it wouldn't have come if I'd have been seditious. It wouldn't have come if I'd have begun to be disloyal. It wouldn't have come if I would have been untrustworthy. It only came through obedience over time. And I didn't know, and he, here's the thing, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on this side of the transfer but when I was on this other side of the transfer, I didn't know when it was going to come. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be 18. See, when, before it happens, you don't know if it's going to be 18 or 20 or 30. But you just got to make up in your mind that 
It's not about what you get. It's about, let, let me help. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be, be, when I came into this house, when I, when I came into the ministry, I did not come to take over the church. I came, my, my, my thought process was I'm going to join this ministry so I can hold his hand. I'm going to hold his arms up. I made a decision when I came in. If all I do is hold this man's arms up, that's enough. That's enough for me. I don't need the church. I don't need to go plant a church. I wasn't ambitious in that way. I said, if I can just come and hold his arms up to help him do what he's done for me to, for 18 years for others. And you know what I, you know what I count on? I just want to get to heaven. I want to get to heaven. Because along the way, man, you got a lot of people's, te- t- you know, they, 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 they got their opinion of me. How does somebody stay 18 years? You, you, know, you know what I'm saying. They'll call you all kinds of things. They'll call you all kinds of names. But you know what? I don't care what you call me. All I care is what Jesus calls me. And when I get there, see, a lot of people that, 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 that say things, they, 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 they're gone. Bill Wilson told me, if you stay in long enough, brother, you'll see them float down the river. That's what Bill Wilson told me. He goes, you stay in long enough, brother, you'll see all your enemies floating down the river. And you'll still be there doing what you do. Because at the end of the day, what I'm interested in and what you should be interested in is when you get in front of Jesus that he looks at you and he goes, oh, my God, you're the most loyal guy I've ever, I can't believe you didn't leave. You you didn't leave. I'm not even doing it so he can say, Wow, you built a 10,000-member church. I'm not doing it. I just want to get up there and for him to look at me and say, man, you're loyal. That's the inside of my, my, inside of my being. Man, you're loyal. You stayed with your wife. You stayed with your children. You stayed with your church. You stayed with your pastor. Man, you're loyal. That's rare. It's rare. So I've just made, it my, I've made my mind up that I'm willing to die for it all the way, no matter what comes, no matter what comes. And the more I tell you, the, the more in I am, because if I leave, you're going to be reminding me <laughs> of what I said on that Wednesday night. So this is how I hold myself accountable. I confess what I believe. And it holds me in my destiny, and it holds me in something. you got to be able to do that. Do you have that deep down on your side? See, a lot of, you, a lot of men, what we have on the inside is we have an ambition. We have something we want to build. we got accolades that we want for ourselves. we got things that we're looking to do for the Lord. But the Lord is saying, would you just be my servant? Would you be willing to watch my sheep? When they went and got David, listen, they didn't pick any of them, and then they finally said, hey, is this all of them? No, there's one more. He said, there's the young one. In Hebrew, the word young is katan. The word katan means insignificant. Some scholars even say it means worthless. I don't even need you at the sacrifice, David. You just stay out there with the animals. You hear what I'm saying? Do you think David had a father wound? (laughs) I wonder about if David did not have a father wound. Because his dad said, you know, we read it, it it sounds really, oh, he's the youngest. He's the baby. (laughs) That's not what that word meant. It can mean small. It means small, insignificant. That's what it means. God will use the insignificant thing and make it a king. So, you're labeled. Some of you that are in here, I'm looking around. You're labeled as something. You're an addict. You're an alcoholic. You're never going to make it. You, you pick it. The, the culture around you and people around you label you for what you are. And you think, I'm small. I'm insignificant. But let me tell you something. Just because you're small and insignificant doesn't mean he's going to pick you. It's if you become faithful to him. Will you become faithful to God? 
Give him something to work with. When you become faithful to him, when you be say, I'm going to do whatever i got to do. I'll move the chairs. I'll stack the chairs. I'll put the, I'll put the table out. I'll clean the restrooms. I'll throw the trash. As long as I'm near you, Lord, whatever you need me to do, because I'm insignificant. What we don't need is a bunch of guys that wait till I come around the corner and then they see me and they're like, oh, there's Pastor Robert in the middle of the trash. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. That's a song. <laughs> no, no, no. I ain't going to do it. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to do it. We're live streaming. Never do that on live stream. <laughs> the motive, you see, because when you start doing things so that you can be noticed, then your motive is wrong and your heart is wrong. Now you're what they call an outward appearance guy. You're trying to do things when everybody can notice you. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, do you know, really, do you understand what I mean? You start doing things so everybody can notice you because you think that you got to promote yourself because you're so, your mind is so in, in entwined in the culture that that's how the culture that's how the street is that's how it is in the world when you go to work that's how it is it's politics it's it's making the right move at the right time so that you can be noticed and so that so that somebody can promote you because you can't count on anybody but God doesn't work that way so you got to change your thinking when you come into the church it doesn't matter where you went to Bible school for me and for God what matters is will you be faithful in this? Before I give you sheep, before you ever lead in this house, let me be clear with everybody in here. You cannot lead in this house unless you get in the process. And you get commissioned and you tithe because I'm not giving you sheep unless I can trust you. You, you should be happy about that if you're a member. I'm not going to give you people if you are bucking me about getting commissioned because you think you already know it all. It ain't about what you know, it's about your faithfulness. If you can't be faithful to my ask, I don't need you in leadership. You're welcome to come to church and enjoy everything we do, but you're not going to be a leader here. Is that kind of hard? I know that's kind of hard, but I, that, that's just the way it is. So when, whenever I, call, I do a call for leadership, you know, it, it kind of eliminates a lot. I don't even, some people might be listening to me right now going, man, I don't want nothing to do with that leadership at that church. I mean, if you're there, you really don't need to be in leadership because, man, leadership costs you. Leadership is going to cost you. Leadership is going to take your time. You're going to be taking late-night phone calls. You're going to be meeting with people you don't want to meet with. You're going to have to be helping people. You're going to have to come when I tell you to come. Now, I'm never going to have you come wash my car. Do you hear what? It's not about that. I'm never going to ask you to do something that I, that I'm, that, that I wouldn't do. I'm not going to, I'm not, it's not going to be weird, but what I'm saying is when I need you, I need you in leadership. When your family needs you, they need you in leadership, right? So, so he picked the insignificant one. He pulled him up, and then when he showed up, when the insignificant showed up, God said, anoint him. That's the one. That's the one. Pour oil on him. So they opened the horn up, they poured oil on him, and they anointed him. The Bible says, I love the way this ends because it's just like, wow. David was the youngest of Jesus' sons, verse 14, since David's, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one. Hold on. He says, so David stood there among his brothers. David stood among all his brothers, and they poured oil on him. Samuel took the olive oil he had brought, and he poured it on David's head, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him from that day on. Then, I love the way it ends, then, Daniel, then Samuel returned to Ramah. It was over. It was over, just like that. They called him from the field. They bring him in. They pour oil on him, his whole brothers. They, so the Spirit of the Lord came mightily on him. So I don't know how it came on him. But it was so mighty that everybody noticed that it came on him. It wasn't unnoticeable that something had come on him. You, you hear me? So all his brothers saw, he just got picked. The next thing, so, so he just got anointed as king. 
But this guy, in the next few chapters, he ends up serving the king that he's going to replace. The king that he's going to replace, Saul, begins to have tormenting spirits that are, that are bugging him. So they say, who can, he, they, I need some help. And somebody says, I know a guy named, I, I, that kid named David. Man, the spirit of God is on him. When he plays his guitar, it was actually a liar. But I like to use guitar because I'm a guitar player. When he plays his guitar, man, the spirits flee. He had an anointing on him that went the, he would go to the, to the king that he was going to replace, and he would play and soothe the king. Now, let me tell you about this man's heart. He's already anointed king, and he's going to the one he's going to replace, but he's never acting like, I'm the one that's going to replace you. Do you see that? The heart of that man, that's what your heart needs to be. Your heart needs to be that way. You know, you've got a, you know you're anointed, but you're willing to serve even under the unanointed one. So stop making excuses that you don't want to be in this and be in that because the leadership this, the leadership that, it ain't about that. It's about whether you will submit to God or not. That's what it's about. You hear me? It ain't about your mentor, although mentors are good. It's about will you sit under somebody knowing that you've got all the anointing and the call of God all over you, but you sit under somebody that you know can't help you, and you just honor them for the position because God chose him. David, his whole life, wouldn't touch Saul because he said, I will not touch someone who God picked. Even if God has unpicked him, I will not touch him. You hear what I'm saying? He went through a process of serving Saul. And then in the Bible, when they started fighting with the Philistines in, verse, in, in, in chapter 17, his brothers were at war. David, it actually says that David was with Saul, but at times he would leave Saul and he would go take care of his father's sheep. Come on, somebody. You just got anointed king. You just got told the whole kingdom is yours and you're still watching sheep. Don't raise your hand, but how many of y'all know that if somebody anointed you king and they said, man, I need you to go to Champion Center again this weekend? <laughs> I'm anointed king. I don't do Champion Center anymore. I'm going to preach. But David didn't have that heart. He says, I know I'm anointed king, but I'm going to be obedient to my father and remain faithful to him. And I'm going to take care of those sheep just like I've always taken care of those sheep. And in the process of taking care of those sheep, he killed the lion and the bear. He was being trained. He was in a process. He was serving Saul, playing his guitar. Saul would get mad. It says in the scripture that he threw a spear at him. David just ducked, came back around, started playing the guitar again. Didn't even say he ran. He just kept on going. He just kept on going. Come on, somebody, somebody in leadership throws a spear at you while you're serving with them. How many of y'all are going to keep on going or how many of y'all are going to pack up and leave? You know that 95% of y'all will pack up and leave because we're that in the flesh. Ah. David is a, is a model, is, a, is an example of the process. What's it going to cost you? It's going to cost you everything. The gospel is free, but it costs Jesus' his life. To, you know, the, the, I don't know if you've read your Bible, but all those guys that walked with him died. And they didn't die old. They killed them. In, the, in, in American Christianity today, man, we want to live large. If we're serving God. God forbid my life be required of me. You wonder, you wonder what would you really do if somebody said deny Christ or you die? What would you really do? I mean, you know, we're all sitting in here. We're going to say I die for the glory of the Lord. And you shake your hand like that. We will see. 
<laughs> you believe it? Do you believe what you believe? Or are you just piddling around with it? Are you, in the pro- are you willing to get in the process, be challenged and changed? Die to yourself, die to your ways, die the way you think. Put it to death and say, you know what? To live is Christ and to die is gain. See, that, that's the kind of Christianity that's in this Bible. And that's the kind of Christianity we got to impart into our men if our, if our churches are ever going to get out of the mess that we're in. If our, if our society is ever going to change, if our, if our families are ever going to change. He was in a process. He started serving. Then he, he went between working. He, it says, but David went back and forth between working for Saul and helping his father with the, with the sheep. In Bethlehem. One day Jesse said to David, hey, David, come here. Take this, take these crackers, take this cheese, and go down for your brothers. Make sure they got something to eat. The assignment was not even to kill the giant. Because this is where he kills the giant. The assignment that God gave him was not to kill the giant. The assignment that God gave him, he gave him because he he knew that that cheese and those crackers were going to get there. Can I send you for cheese and crackers? (laughs) Are you trustworthy for cheese and crackers? Can I trust you? Can your, can your family trust you with cheese and crackers? Because along the way, as you take the cheese and crackers, what happened to him is he killed a giant. So quit looking at your assignment and judging your worth by your assignment. There'll be a giant. There's going to be a giant when you're doing the simple thing. And if you're caught doing this, if, he, if he'd have said, I'm the anointed king of Israel, get somebody else to take the crackers and the cheese. I'm tired of you looking at me and ignoring the fact that Samuel the prophet himself anointed me right here in this house in front of everybody, and y'all have been ignoring me for years, and you've been just toying with me and making me watch the sheep, and... <sighs> That actually sounds like a more realistic story. But he took the assignment. Will you take the insignificant assignment? Will you pray with your eight-year-old? It seems insignificant. It seems like they're not even paying attention to you. Anybody know? I have an eight-year-old. And I'll read a Bible story, and when I'm done reading, I'll look up, and they're in la-la land. Or asleep. Or I'll be in the middle of the story. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm like, it's not like it's me and a crowd of people. It's me and you, and you're leaving me, and I'm reading to you. You. (laughs) It It seems insignificant. It seems like something along the way. But you know what? I just keep doing it. I just keep doing it. I just keep doing what I'm supposed to do. I just keep praying with them. I keep reading the Bible to them. I keep praying for my wife at night before we go to bed. I keep praying with my wife when we get up in the morning. I just keep coming to work. I keep mentoring. I keep coming to Wednesday night. I keep preaching the Bible. I keep doing what I'm doing. And along the way, a giant shows up. And I'm full of faith. Because I've been found doing what I'm supposed to be doing. See, a lot of times when the giant shows up, you haven't been doing what you're supposed to be doing, so you don't have what it takes. So you're, you're, you got Brandon on the main line. Pastor Brandon, I don't know what to do. But God is, God is saying, if you will do the insignificant things, the things that I've asked you to do, to be in church, to serve, to, to, to serve people. Listen to me. When, when you serve, God is, is, is shaping you. And he's removing you off of you 
to make you a servant leader. It's not just serving. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you come and you give up your time, it's, it's a time in the mill where God begins to scrape you on the sides and say, I know you didn't want to come here, but you came here anyway to serve. You're working that thing out. You're exposing your own heart like, man, I'm really selfish. You, you know, anybody ever start serving and go like, wow, I'm really selfish with my Saturdays. And, you know, he starts exposing us. He starts showing us. He's honing us. He's serving. And it's not about even the thing that you're doing. It's not about the food distribution. It's not about that. It's about you becoming more like him. It's about you be, being to, to be able to see yourself as God sees you, a servant leader, a leader in your family. 